Video games, just like movies or art, do not exist in a void. They are often remembered from the viewpoint of people who were present and aware during their release. What might be one of my favorite games might be overlooked or disliked by someone else. Defining what constitutes a good game is difficult. There's countless factors in play such as story, the likability of characters, and how the player identifies with them. The flow of the game in terms of gameplay and a lot of these factors have to be combined along with the charter of reference from the player. Different people like different things, and this is one of the things which we'll have to accept. Today, I want to talk about a game which meant a lot to me in my childhood. It's a game that I never saw any advertisement for, but when it came out I managed to get a hold of it thanks to my cousin buying it for me for my birthday. Whenever I mention the title I'm usually met with a blank stare, none of my friends remember playing it, but when I was clearing out some boxes and I found the disc again, I was instantly remembering the days when I used to play it. Hey there buddy, I'm the dadliest man in town, and today I'm going to tell you the story of a game called Silver. We'll be going throughout the game and the studio's development. We'll talk about gameplay, I'll take you through the full story, and at the end of the video, just like the ones before, I'll give you my opinion on the game. And hopefully, by that time, you'll have formed your own opinion as well. If you'd like to support the channel, be sure to give the video a like or subscribe to the channel if you feel like it. You don't have to, but it would mean a lot to me if you did. And just in case that this 24 year old game suddenly popped up on your radar before you click this video, full spoiler warning ahead for the plot to Silver. In order to fully understand the history of Silver, we'll need to head back to 1983, specifically to Great Britain with two men called John Woods and David Ward. John and David created Spectrum Games, a mail-order business which focused on creating and sending out clones of arcade games like Frogger and Missile Command. These were meant for home computers such as the ZX Spectrum and the VIC-20 back in the day. Unfortunately for them, their choice in naming the company Spectrum Games gave some customers the idea that the only platform they would provide games for was the ZX Spectrum, so they chose to later rename the company to Ocean Software. By the middle and the end of the 80s, the company had grown considerably, and they started creating games based on then-popular movie franchises such as Short Circuit, Bless You, Johnny No. 5, and Rambo. In 1988 specifically, they created a home version of Data East's Robocop game, which garnered a lot of good publicity for the company. Warner Brothers would later ask Ocean to create the game for the 1989 Batman movie, directed by Tim Burton. The movie was wildly popular, and in effect, this meant great sales for the video game tie-in. Things were simpler back in those days. In any case, producing two major titles in such an effectively short time span cemented Ocean's place in the developer community, and from there, things sped up exponentially. Ocean would later be bought by and merged with French publisher Infogram. We talked about them in the Alone in the Dark videos from a while back. Before and during this merger, a small team at Ocean had started work on the game that would later be known as Silver. The team wanted to create an action RPG with a mix of pre-rendered backgrounds and 3D characters. Development didn't go smoothly, unfortunately, as mentioned in an interview with Forbes by Bobby Earl, a man who at one point had been a technical director at the studio. After the merger with Infogram, Several different development managers came along on the project, and they decided to push the game into several different directions, creating delays in getting the game out in the long run. What also didn't help was that they were a small team, only consisting of about 10 people at the time, so the fact that they managed to bring out a game in only 4 years was impressive to say the least. Infogram apparently also noticed the team's capabilities, as after the release of Silver, they were given the opportunity and cash to start up their own studio named Spiral House. After the company was created, the team set out to make ports of Silver for the Dreamcast and the Mac, and also started doing some pre-production work on the sequel, Silver 2. Unfortunately though, there would never be a Silver 2, 
as Infogram considered Alone in the Dark 4 to be of a higher priority at the time, shelving the concept for the sequel to Silver. Spiral House would go on to create many other games, so we'll surely get back to them at some point. But for today, we're going to focus on Silver in particular. Silver was released in 1999 for PC and in 2000 for the Dreamcast, and it is with this that we're going to go through the story of Silver. We start the game off in the world of Jara as a character called Fuge makes his way into town and is taking all the women onto his ship. His father, Silver, an evil sorcerer, has apparently decided he wants to take a new bride and decided that one of the women in town will have to become his wife, regardless of whether they're already married or not. Some people try to resist Fuge's taking of their wives, but the big guy apparently has enough gravitas to make sure nobody tries to stop him further. Fuge gives his men the signal to go further inland and find more women for them to take back to his ship. We'll now switch to a small cabin in the woods where we meet our main character David, along with his grandfather, fittingly named Grandad. Grandad tells us that he wants to train, but we're going to need a sword and a shield before we're able to do so. Inside the house where we find our equipment in a chest, we'll also meet David's wife, Jennifer. We'll give her a quick hello before we go outside to train. Once outside and with the correct equipment, we'll have a sparring session with Grandad. This will mainly act as the general combinatorial for the game, as it can be a bit confusing in the beginning. David will walk or run based on a single or double mouse click on the map. We'll have to click once to have him walk and twice to make him run in the direction that we want to. This will also have the effect of David turning in a certain direction. Combat, however, is a whole other beast. We'll have to hold the control button and make several gestures such as dragging the pointer left and right or up and down to make David attack in various kinds of ways. It takes a bit of getting used to in the beginning, but to be fair, the combat system grew on me pretty quickly while I was playing the game. In any case, after Grandad is done putting us through the ringer with training, Fuge will show up and take Jennifer away from us. We try to follow him, but unfortunately, on our way to where he made off with David's wife, we're held up constantly by Fuge's men, who keep throwing themselves at us in an effort to slow us down. Eventually, we'll make our way to the port where Fuge set foot on land, but unfortunately, the ship has already set off, taking Jennifer with it. Grandad suggests that in order to find out where the ship is going, we'll have to use the telescope in order to see which direction it was headed. The only way we can get there is through a place called Haven. We'll backtrack our way through the path we took to follow Fuge, slaughtering countless of his men in the process, and make our way through barracks before we come to a magical gate, which cannot be crossed if one contains evil within their heart. Grandad crosses without any issues, but David worries that due to the anger he feels because of Fuge taking his wife, he might not be able to cross it. Grandad assures David that he'll be okay, but soldiers suddenly show up. We'll try to fight him off as best as we can, but unfortunately they keep coming, so we decide to run for it towards the magical gate, taking our chances. Luckily, we can pass through the gate without any issues. One of the soldiers is ordered by his commander to follow us, but the poor bastard is instantly destroyed by the gate's magic, blowing him up into tiny little giblets. The other soldiers decide to take another way around the gate, and for now, we're safe to continue our way. We'll move along the path and come across a cave where a ferocious sound is heard from. We'll try and check it out, but due to it being so dark, we decide not to head in any further until we can bring something to light up the darkness. Seeing as the cave path is out of the question, we'll move to the left instead. We end up in a clearing where we note that it's quiet. Too quiet, in fact. Of course, our feelings are correct as we find ourselves suddenly surrounded by a group of warriors led by a man called Duke, who has a profile picture which looks like he's perpetually screaming for some reason. We find out that the warriors are a group of rebels who want to strike back at Silver for taking their wives and loved ones from them. We explain to Duke that we're also in a quest to save our wife from Silver's clutches, and Duke in turn gives us access to the camp where him and his men are preparing. 
We'll talk to the men in the camp, learning of their motivations for joining the cause, and find a torch near the campfire. Having done everything that we can here, we'll head back to the cave that we were chased out earlier. When we make our way inside, we find out that there wasn't some massive beast skulking around, but it was actually a kid making the sound that chased us out of the cave last time. We'll let the kid leave, Grandad giving him a scolding before he does so, before we move on towards our next destination, the Library of No. As soon as we get inside the library, we'll see a character called the Professor being attacked by imps. The imps aren't a big challenge, it's mostly that they attack in large numbers, so we'll dispose of them and save the professor before we head further into the library. As we make our way from one room to another, slaughtering about 70% of Jara's imp population in about 5 minutes, we find a gold imp who tells us that he'll give us some more treasure if we let him live. Of course, imps being imps, the little shit betrays us and runs off. When we give chase and follow him into another room, he turns into a bigger form, and it's with this that we're dealing with our first mini-boss. I wouldn't call it an actual boss. He's not tough to beat. We can soak up most of his damage, and by using the thrust move, we can take his health down pretty quickly if we keep fighting purely focused on close combat. Once we kill him, we're free to continue on through the library once more until we get to the top floor, where we meet Taronis. Taronis tells us that we can't use the telescope, as it is currently inoperable. We'll have to head into the library's catacombs to fix it. He then presents us with a new weapon, the Ice Wand. We'll pick that up before he teleports us back down to the library's entrance. Grandad opts to take the stairs, as he doesn't care much for magic. When we get to the entrance, Fuge is already there, waiting for us. Grandad arrives and even though we're there, he tells us he will fight Fuge on his own to buy us time to escape. The old man puts up a valiant fight, but eventually Fuge gets the better of him. He uses his lightning magic to destroy Grandad and then goads us to come down and fight him as well, telling us that besides killing Grandad, he was also the one that killed David's father. Now, we could actually go down and face Fuge. The game does nothing to actively stop us from doing so. However, if we do, the game is essentially over, as there is no way for us to beat him this early in the game. We'll follow Taronis through a magical sealed door and make our way further into another part of No. Using the Ice Wand, we're able to fight off the imps from both a distance and close up. We'll get to a room where we meet a purple imp called Frank, along with a character called Dr. Bazuki. They'll play a somewhat bigger role in the rest of the game, but they aren't all that important in this section. Further into the dungeon, we'll fight off some new enemies called golems. They are particularly weak against magic, making the Ice Wand a good item to fight them off with, even though they're quite tanky in comparison with the imps. We'll find this mechanic of magical damage versus physical damage more and more prevalent as we'll move through the game. Some enemies or bosses have resistance to certain weapons and weaknesses to another. Sometimes we'll even need to wait until an enemy does a certain move before we'll be able to damage it as we'll see in the upcoming battle. At the end of this dungeon, we'll meet a demon. It'll act as the first proper boss for this game. The demon will shoot fireballs at us which we can dodge by hiding behind the rock in the room. He will spawn imps from time to time which we'll have to kill, but like the rest of them we fought in the library, they don't really pose all that much of a threat. We'll try to attack the demon using the ice wand since it makes sense that the creature being of a fire nature is damaged by ice, but for some reason it doesn't do a lot of damage to him. But remember when I said that sometimes we'd have to wait until an enemy does a certain move? This is exactly the battle where we'll have to put it into practice for the first time. From time to time the demon will do a charging move, evident from the sparks around him. This is the time to strike him with a projectile from the Ice Wand, as it does a ton of damage to the creature. Now that we know about his moveset, it won't take us long to take down the demon, and we'll destroy it. Once we defeat the demon, Duke and the gang will show up just in time to be absolutely useless, and we'll make our way back to the telescope. Using the telescope, we'll see the ship that took Jennifer in the distance, far beyond our grasp. We'll find out that the ship is headed towards the City of Rain. With this, we have our new destination and we'll head to the Rebel camp to stock up on supplies before we make our way to Rain with the Rebels. The whole gang will meet up in front of Rain. 
Duke suggests we split up into groups and pairs us up with Sukuni, a female warrior who is proficient with bows. Our mission is simple. Kill any of Silver's men in rain and get to the galleons in order to save Jennifer. We'll move into this city, running into Silver's men immediately at the entrance. This will be the first time we've played with two playable characters ever since Grandad got killed at the Library of No, and it shows. During the fight, Sukuni will be controlled by the AI, and we'll fight using David as before. However, if we click on Sukuni without holding the control button, we'll select her as a character, transferring the AI control to David instead. It's not a big issue as it's easily reversible, but in later parts of the game where combat is more chaotic, I ran into quite some issues with this. After we kill the initial guards, we'll pick up a weapon to replace our old one and head further into the city, clearing out the streets of enemy soldiers who wish to do us harm. In one of the streets, we'll find an old woman named Edith, set upon by guards. We'll come to her aid and slaughter the guards before making sure she's okay. Edith tells us that her son was once taken by Silver's men and locked up someplace. She hasn't seen him for years, but she's sure that he's still alive for some reason. She gives us her son's old teddy bear, certain that he'll recognize it if we ever manage to come across him in our travels. Eventually, we'll make our way to a tower, where we find out that the Galleons have already left the City of Rain while we were busy fighting off the soldiers. This means that there's no reason for us to go any further in Rain for now so we decide to go back to the rebel camp and regroup while we think of a next step. As we go over our next move in the rebel camp, Frank, the purple imp that we met in the Library of No, will inform us that Dr. Bazuki wants to meet both us and Duke at the Oracle. We'll head towards the Oracle and meet Dr. Bazuki, who tells us that after many years, the Oracle is set to awaken again, allowing us to ask it questions, which we can then have answered. The oracle appears before us as we enter the temple, and we ask what our possibilities are. It tells us that as we are right now, we have no hope of fighting Silver, and we'll need the help of eight magical orbs to hope to match his power. The oracle unfortunately does not know the locations of all the orbs, but it can tell us the location of the fire orb, along with giving us a horn that we will need to access it. It turns out that the first orb resides in Rain, in the tower that we reached during our fight against Silver and Fuge's men. The Oracle disappears, and we'll talk to Duke shortly before we make our way back to Rain. Luckily, we don't need to walk back the entire way anymore, as Duke gives us a map, which will be our main mode of fast travel throughout the game. As we make our way back to the tower, we'll find that the entrance to it is blocked by a magical barrier. We'll use the horn given to us by the oracle, which will dissipate the barrier and allow us access into the tower, you know, after we kill a few more imps, just for good measure. Inside the tower, we'll meet Othias. He'll hear our story about why we want the fire orb, and after some convincing, he'll hand over the magical item, and even allow us to take the contents of a chest in the room, containing a special move alongside a steel key. With the fire orb in our possession, it's time we make our way to our next destination to find the ice orb, conveniently and fittingly located in an area called Winter. Sure enough, when we arrive at Winter, the location is covered in snow. We'll be set upon by guards and later on ice dragons. Now that we have fire magic though, this will make an excellent time to practice with it. Using magic in the game is fairly simple. Just like regular combat, we'll have to equip the orb from the radial menu in order to use it. After this is done, it is a simple matter of clicking the enemy with control held down in order for us to shoot a magic projectile at them. Each use of magic does drain our magic points and at some time we'll be unable to use magic anymore, meaning that we need to wait until our MP regenerates. The ice dragons are particularly susceptible to fire so using it on them will make this section a heck of a lot easier. During our way through winter, we'll encounter multiple groups of enemies one after another. Fire magic will take care of most of our issues, but because of what I mentioned, we need to conserve our MP for later. At the end of the path, we'll get to a cave, in which we'll face pretty much the same, wave after wave of enemies, until we finally reach this area's boss, the Ice Viking. The Ice Viking is one of those bosses that simultaneously is supposed to be challenging, but also to be a test of us grasping our newly learned magical mechanics. 
We're best off not using our sword because the Ice Viking will repel most of the physical damage, so we'll have to resort to using fire magic while Sukuni tries to take care of the smaller adds. When the adds die, they'll leave small blue orbs, which we can use to replenish our magic points. With the boss's weakness against this type of magic, it won't take too long before we're able to take him down. With the boss dead, we'll be able to gain possession of the Ice Orb. We'll also meet a new character, Professor Velding who will inform us that the health orb is hidden somewhere underwater, and we'll have to gain the assistance of someone in rain called Thaddeus to get to where it is since he has possession of a device called the bathosphere. With this, we have our next destination. We're heading back to rain. Unfortunately, with the items that we have right now, we're unable to progress to Thaddeus just yet. So before we head to rain, we're going to make a small detour to David's house where we started off our adventure. From here, we'll move to the east, taking down the woodland creatures in this area with either a sword or with fire magic. Eventually, after moving through a few more sections, we'll enter an area with a gorge, a cottage standing on top of it. When we get inside, we see a new character called Vivian. Apparently, Silver's men were trying to take her along as well, but she's tough and she didn't need our help to fight him off. We explain to Vivian what we're trying to do and she decides to join us on our quest, finally giving us a full party of three. We'll head out from Vivian's cottage and make our way to the next area, where we'll meet the Mayor of Rain, who immediately thinks that we're trying to attack him. He'll send his men after us, but they run off after only a few attacks, leaving the Mayor behind. The Mayor in turn runs off as well, but not before leaving the key to the city. This was exactly the item we needed in order to get further into Rain. A little bit further from the place we meet the mayor, we'll get into an area infested with fire enemies. This seems like a good time to start using the ice orb that we got from the ice viking a while ago. Using it on the fire enemies makes it a cakewalk, but of course we'll have to make sure that we have enough magic points to fight them all off. We'll have the ice wand for backup, but you'll notice that lower level weapons tend to start lagging behind in damage to the enemies pretty quickly. Eventually, after fighting through another onslaught of enemies, we find our way towards this area's boss, a fire demon. Now that we're a party of three, we can use the other members as Michi, I mean support. As long as the fire demon is targeting them, we can unload the barrage of ice magic at him, which will diminish his health fairly quickly. If he does target us at some point, we can use the rocky area in the center as a shield to block his attacks. All in all, it's not a tough battle, just like the other ones and as long as we manage to hit him with ice attacks, we're able to take him down. Once he is down, we'll move up but we're unable to progress any further due to a fire that we can't move past at this point in the story. Now, finally, we can head to Rain after this little side bit. We'll use fast travel to get to Rain once more. We'll make our way through the entrance until we get to the gate where we can use the city key that we took off of the mayor in the forest. We're now heading into upper rain and the places infested with thugs and other enemies on nearly every screen. To be fair, now that we're a full party, it's much easier to clear them out because the enemies no longer gang up on us and one other party member. Combat seems a bit more spread out and we're able to support our party members more when we take care of the enemy we're facing ourselves. We'll have to fight through several sections of enemies until we finally reach a tavern near the edge of the city. Inside the tavern, we'll have to do a few actions which we'll need to finish to progress through the story. We'll first talk to Randolph the Magician. He's drunk off his ass but he wants to sell us a fire sword for 100 gold coins. Considering that magic is going to be more important later on, and we'll want to have a backup, we'll take him up on his offer. After we're done with Randolph, we'll talk to Jonah, a pirate captain who's trying to sell us a cursed doubloon. This is going to be important later on, so we'll pay him the 30 gold and take it off of him. We'll now talk to Albert, a shady old man who will give us information on how we're able to get into Lower Rain which is where we'll need to head to next in order to reach Thaddeus. It turns out there is a bell that has to be rung in a certain sequence before we're allowed entrance. The sequence is ringing the bell three times, taking a short pause, then ringing it two times, pause again, only to ring it one more time after. Finally, the last person we talk to is a hulking man named Jug. 
He'll be a bit standoffish to David, and the conversation devolves into a full-on brawl between several of the tavern members, Jug, and our party. After the fight concludes, Jug is impressed by how we handled ourselves, and he offers to join the party. At this point, I felt Sukuni was somewhat lagging behind in the damage department, since she's dependent on using ranged weaponry, and I just didn't bother with keeping up buying arrows and the like. So we'll send Sukuni back to the rebel camp as we take Jug along to join David and Vivian. Now that we're done in the tavern, it's time to make our way to lower rain. We'll have to fight our way through waves of enemies once more on our way there, but with both Jug and Vivian in our party, it makes it a lot easier since Jug is a lot better at close ranged combat than Sukuni was. Some of the combat is annoying in upper rain because of the fixed camera placement. There are sections where characters are so far off the distance, it makes it difficult to place David correctly for attacks since the character models are too small to make them out correctly. It's only in this part that I had this issue, but it was a small gripe nonetheless. Finally, we'll reach the entrance to Lorraine along with the longest boss fight we'll face in the game. This goddamn bell. Let me explain. The timing with the pauses has to be exact. We need to click the bell in order to ring it, but even a slight delay in clicking it will count as a pause, and if we wait for even more than a second, the bell will reset the invisible counter, forcing us to do the sequence over again. David will nod when we get the sequence correct, but even so, it was infuriating to try and get it right, and it took me more than a fair number of tries before I could get the gate to open. Once we're in though, we'll move into an alley nearby and find Albert standing there once again. He'll warn us about a werewolf in the area and that we'll need silver to fight it. The metal, not the evil bad guy from the game. Honestly, I don't trust this guy one bit, but just to be sure, we'll buy the silver off of him. Sure enough, on the next screen, we'll encounter a man hunched over and David gets a bad feeling before the man turns into a werewolf right in front of us. Now, the werewolf fight is more like a mini-boss than anything else. It's a simple tank the damage while you wail on him kind of fight, so there's nothing in the sense of strategy to win against him. We probably could have beaten him without buying the silver off of Albert, but having it on us makes our attacks deal more damage to him and allow us to finish this fight a bit faster. After we're done with the werewolf, we'll continue on through lower rain, killing enemies left and right before we meet the ferryman. Clearly modeled after Kron, the ferryman who guides souls into the underworld. Using his raft, he'll guide us to the Tower of Thaddeus. A giant head appears and informs us that an evil sorceress named Rita has escaped, and we need to recruit five teenagers with attitude to... No, wait. No, wait, hold on, that's the wrong script. Uh... No, instead the giant floating head turns out to be Thaddeus himself. He hears our plight and allows us to use his bathosphere to gain access to spires where the health orb resides. While we head off to spires and the bathosphere, we're treated to a cutscene of Silver being less than amused that we've already been able to gain two of the orbs. He berates his henchmen and sends one of his elite, Jag, to spires in order to catch us. You are all selected to serve in my elite guard, and yet you repay me with incompetence! Tell me, why are these rebels still alive? Our guards can't- Quiet! There are no excuses for failure. Fortunately for you, I acquired a little insurance of my own. What insurance? A rebel informant. The fools are turning on themselves. Can we trust the word of a recreant? He is stupid and weak. He will not defy me. Jag, step forward. So far, the rebel's betrayal has been most engaging. But I was disturbed to learn that they too are searching for the orbs and are unfortunately having a great deal more success than you. I'm sorry, sire. 
Stop sniveling! Just take the diving bell and go to the Cathedral in Spires. It seems it houses the Orb of Healing. And wait there in ambush for the rebels to try and retrieve it. And when you've killed them, bring the Orb to me and tag. Do not fail me. Fuse, you go to chains and prevent the Duke's pitiful attempt at a jailbreak. But don't kill him. We'll use him as bait. As for the others, show no mercy. And you, assure me that the orb in your possession is safe? Yes, father. I have assigned Draco my most lethal guardian to protect it. Then you have no need for concern. When we get to Spires, we'll be faced with new enemies, a type of fish people wielding spears and what would appear to be giant mutated lobsters, I guess? Anyway, they're nothing special, really. They're not vulnerable to any type of magic, so we're relegated to using our basic weaponry to take them down room by room and progress the old-fashioned way. You know, by killing countless of them. Now, while most of them use simple weaponry, some of them apparently have the capacity of using magic. It's best to target them first, since they can do some damage from a distance, but at this point of the game, they don't pose too much of a threat. Eventually, we'll reach a large room where Jag is waiting for us, goading us into battle with him. David warns him to turn around as a large green dragon descends from above. Jag doesn't believe us at first, but when he does turn around, it's already too late. The dragon fires his green fire breath at him, killing him instantly. While this does take care of Silver's minion for us, this does leave us an angry green dragon standing between us and the health orb. The dragon will move between a few locations in the room. While normally you'd want to create as much distance between yourself and a flying enemy, this is exactly what you don't want to do in this instance. His weakness is ice magic. But trying to use it on him from a distance will show that even that hardly does any damage. Instead, we need to run up to the dragon, dodging his shots until we get underneath him, and then fire the ice magic up into him. This will finally give us the damage numbers we want. We'll only get enough time to fire off a single shot as he will smash into the ground in response, causing a blast to form around him. This is pretty much how the entire fight goes, and eventually, just like the other enemies, the dragon will fall, finally giving us possession of the health orb. The health orb is one of the most handy magic items to have in the game. As we level up after every boss battle, our health will increase more and more, which will leave us consuming insane amounts of food to heal up after our health gets low. The health magic will allow us to heal up huge amounts in return of most of our mana pool, but it's worth it in the long run. We're done in Spires for now, but before we leave, we need one more thing, an amulet called the Infernum Extinguere. As we'll need it to progress through the firewoods we encountered after fighting the fire demon. From Spires, we'll move back to the fire tree. Once we click it, the amulet will extinguish the flames, allowing us to progress. Frank will show up and tell us that Dr. Bazuki wants to see us, but all that means is that he has some more potions to sell us, so we'll let that go for now. We now end up in a swamp-like area. Like Spires, the enemies here are not vulnerable to any type of magic, so we're relegated to using our physical weapons once again. We'll move to the left first and continue on until we end up in an arena where we'll be forced to fight off a swamp monster. The swamp monster is one of the only enemies besides the green dragon where I felt that actual tactics came into play more due to his attack pattern. We'll attack him using our regular weapons and heal up frequently when he hits us because his attacks tend to do quite a lot of damage. He has one attack which rains fire on us, which is especially damaging, so we'll have to dodge that one when it pops up, evident from his charging move before he unleashes it. 
will keep up this attack pattern of healing and dodging, and before too long, he'll go down. In a chest in the back of the arena we just fought the monster in, we'll find a lightning staff and a bronze key before we head back. We'll take the different path at the crossroads this time before we eventually end up at a monastery. A monk named Kagan shows up, and he tells us that the other monks inside have gone mad due to drinking poisoned water of some sorts. We'll let Kagan join our crew, sending Jug back to the rebel camp, and then we'll head towards the monastery. Unfortunately for Kagan's brethren, there's nothing we can do at this point to save them, and we move throughout the monastery, killing them in every room we encounter. In one of the rooms, we'll see a monk praying. More of them will show up as we close in on him, but just like the others, they'll fall quite quickly, even leaving us a special attack that we can pick up. Eventually, after having cleared out the monastery, we'll meet a mystic monk in a cave. He too wasn't affected by the events in the monastery since he's been meditating this whole time. He asks us if we can give him one of life's great questions to meditate about before he will help us further in this quest. Of course, this being an RPG, we'll go look for life's great questions for the monk. It's not like every minute we wait a maniacal wizard that has kidnapped our wife might kill her or god knows what. We head back to the Library of No and meet Professor Whittle. It just so happens that he just finished pondering over a document which contained one of life's great questions. The plot convenience is staggering to say the least. In any case, we'll take the document back to the monk and he'll thank us by handing over an ethereal potion. This will transport our soul back in time to when Silver invaded the house of an artist called Reuben. Reuben is incinerated by Silver, only leaving behind his smoldering remains and a wooden key. We pick up the wooden key and surprisingly, we have it in our possession when we return back to our senses. We leave the monk to ponder about the question and head back to David's house. From here, we'll move eastward, killing the enemies we face with ease since at this point we've gotten quite overpowered due to the game not having any form of level scaling on enemies in areas we went through earlier. We'll reach a waterfall along with stairs leading up a hilltop, leading to a small house on top of it. We'll use the wooden key and open up the door where we meet Chiaro, Ruben's protege. Unfortunately, we have to inform him that Ruben is dead due to silver and this sends the youth into a fit of rage where he wants to join us on our quest. Unfortunately for him, we're not too confident in his skills just yet, so we'll send him over to the rebel camp while we continue on our quest. After Chiaro is off, we'll head upstairs and open up the chest to find the lightning orb sitting inside. This makes orb number 4, meaning we're already halfway to our goal. With the lightning orb in our possession, it's time for our next destination. We'll head back to Winter, taking a different path than the one we took last time towards Glass's palace, Silver's daughter. When we reach the palace entry, we'll use the bronze key from the swamp monster we killed earlier in the game to gain entry to the stronghold. The enemies in Glass's palace aren't particularly susceptible to any kind of magic, so we'll use our regular weapons to fight our way through. We'll make our way to the palace's throne room and find another dragon to be this section's boss. This time, it's an ice dragon. The ice dragon is, in my opinion, one of the more challenging bosses in the game. While he's vulnerable to take an educated guess fire magic, he can only be damaged properly when he's charging just like a few of the earlier boss enemies we fought in the game. It seems this charging before you can damage them mechanic is one that the developers used in the game a multitude of times, and to be fair, it grew tiring to have it be the same strategy over and over. We'll be fighting this beast on our own, as at the beginning of the fight, the rest of the party will be frozen solid. They still have a use though. The Ice Dragon will shoot multiple waves of ice missiles at us, and we can use the frozen bodies of our party members as shields to hide behind. The Ice Dragon has a fairly simple routine in his attacks. His first move is to fire three ice bolts at us, followed by several smaller bolts in a wave. After this, he'll start charging, which will be our moment to attack him with a fire bolt. After this, he'll do the same move, which we can either dodge or use our teammates for to block it. During these phases, he'll drop magic orbs, which we can use to replenish our MP. We might take a few hits while reaching for them or during his last attack phase, which showers most of the room with icicles, but it's nothing we can't handle at this point. Eventually, after a fight that in my opinion took way longer than it should have, we'll finish off the Ice Dragon and we're ready to move on with our quest. 
After we've taken him down, we can make our way to the back of the throne room, and we'll head outside where we'll find the Earth Orb, and the key to the barracks, which I suspect will be our next destination. After the fight at Glass's Palace, we'll travel back to the Rebel camp where we find out that the Rebels were ambushed and captured. A few of them managed to get away and we'll talk to Bob and the others to find out that we'll have to head to Rain's sewer system to infiltrate the location where the Rebels are being held. In order to get access to it, we'll have to go back to the tavern where we met Jug. The barkeep will show us a secret entrance to the sewers after we give him a passcode. After we made our way to the sewers, we'll learn a new special move called the Falcon, which honestly is one of the best moves in the game to have because of its flexibility in combat. Once we're in the sewers proper, we'll be set upon by rat-like enemies. They'll most likely be vulnerable against earth magic, which is good considering the earth orb was the last one we got. This part was frustrating at points due to the positioning of the ranged enemies and ourselves. Some of the rats will be in spots where magic can't reach them and we'll be forced to use our regular ranged weapons in order to kill them. Our main objective in this section will be to unflood a part of rain. Since the sewer system apparently has a valve which is currently closed, we'll make our way from room to room until we eventually find a red valve spanner. We'll pick it up and use it on the machine which will unflood the part of rain we need to be in. This will trigger another cutscene, where Silver apparently isn't all that happy with his people. Yet again, my elite have been outwitted by fools. Jag was weak. He failed. You will not go to the barracks at James. My informant assures me that a small band of rebels are planning to rescue the Duke. Their attack is imminent. Yes, sire. I will not disappoint you. Plus, why did you not tell me of the troubles at your palace? I thought your time too precious to waste on such a minor incident. You dare lie to your father? Do you forget my power? No. There was a breach within the secret chambers of my palace, but I'm sure Draco will have destroyed all the intruders. And the orb? Is it safe? I don't know. What? How can you not know? Kill you, your lineage will mean nothing. Find the intruders, and if they are dead, bring me their bodies when you deliver the orb. You dare to stare at me. Silver will tell one of his henchmen, Khan, to cut us off and kill us while we try to save the rebels. It turns out though that the sewers are hiding another secret. At the end we'll meet a giant rat which we'll have to defeat. He technically counts as a boss, but he's pretty much the same difficulty as a regular enemy. After we kill him, we'll be granted the Acid Orb. Now that Lower Rain is unflooded, we can travel to Thaddeus' tower. We'll take a different path from the last time we went there, heading up some stairs and fighting through waves of enemies intending to stop us from rescuing our rebel friends. On our way to the jails, we meet Khan, who quite frankly gets his ass handed to him within seconds. I expected a lot more than this. The Falcon special move we learn in the sewers takes out almost all of the warriors he brought with him, and when it's the three of us versus him, it's essentially a cakewalk. After defeating Khan, we get his weapon, the Bastard Sword. It's a definite upgrade from the weapons we were using before, and I'm sure we'll use it to great success from here on. We'll use the barracks key we got from Glass's palace to gain entry. Just like before in the sewers, some enemies will have some annoying placements where they're almost impossible to hit with magic and we'll have to resort to ranged weapons. We'll make our way to the dungeons where we meet an old man named Jeremiah, who's locked away in a cage. He'll assist us by throwing down a key which he was hiding... somewhere. 
I, I don't even want to know. A lizard will pick it up, and we'll have to chase the reptile down in order to get our hands on the key. Just like the big rat, the lizard is hardly worth of being considered a boss enemy. He'll go down fairly quickly, and we'll be able to continue on our way before we come face to face with our next enemy. This time, we're facing Fuge himself. Now, Fuge is one of the enemies where there is no kidding around. He's fairly fast, he's strong, and he can take a beating like no other enemy in the game thus far. To be fair, I died the first time I faced him, since immediately attacking him head on will lead absolutely nowhere. There's technically multiple ways to fight him, ranging from using a ring of invisibility to using the exploding vials that we have at our disposal. However, I always liked fighting Fuge in actual sword combat. Fuge will constantly follow us, regardless of where we go, so I tend to face him, get a few hits in, and then backstep quickly. When he makes his way towards us, we'll use a forward lunge attack to get some more damage in before we continue doing this over and over. At one point, Fuge will run off and start to attack us with magic. With the right positioning, we can block his magic without risking any damage and use this time to heal up from any wounds he's inflicted on us by now. Eventually, even the mighty Fuge falls before us, and David finally gets the revenge on the man who killed both his father and granddad. Once we've killed Silver's son, we'll pick up his dual swords. They'll do nice amounts of damage, since they can strike twice, but we won't be able to use a shield. But if I'm perfectly honest, we didn't use those all that much anyway. We'll continue on and find the Jail's Warden, who will kill before we pick up a cell key. In one of the cells, we'll find a guy called Moss. He tells us that he's been in this cell since as long as he can remember. He catches a glimpse of the teddy bear that we got from Edith the first time we visited Rain, and all of a sudden the pieces fall into place. Moss is Edith's son, whom Silver's henchmen put into prison all those years ago. We give Moss his old teddy bear back, and he storms out of the prison in order to be reunited with his mom. With that job done, we can finally get back to freeing Duke and the gang. Duke tells us that it wasn't by accident that Silver's men were able to catch them. There's a traitor within the Rebels. We return to the Rebel camp, and Glass of all people teleports into our midst. She's done with her father's abuse and tells us of a way that we can find out who the traitor is. We'll need to head to a place called Dead Gate, a place where dead souls linger and speak with our deceased comrades to find out who it was that betrayed them. Apparently, to get to Dead Gate, there's only one captain crazy enough to get us there, and it's Jonah, the pirate that we met at the inn in Rain, where he sold us the cursed doubloon which we used to reach Thaddeus. Jonah, being a fearless pirate and quite possibly drunk, will risk getting us to Dead Gate for the price of 300 gold coins. At this point, it's a steal, since we have enough gold to pay that amount 10 times over. When we reach Dead Gate, we'll be fighting a new type of enemy, Skeleton Soldiers. Which I realize now is probably the least original type of enemy to hit this genre of games in a long time. Anyway, there will be a few types, the regular Skeleton Soldiers and the ones with purple armor. We'll need to take down the purple armor soldiers first, as they have the ability to summon new enemies. If this game had a normal leveling system, I'd say this would be the perfect opportunity to grind some experience, but unfortunately we're out of luck with that. Eventually we'll meet one of the rebels, John. He'll realize that he's dead, and it turns out that William is the traitor among the rebels. Having learned this, John asks us to take care of his brother before we head further into Deadgate saving a ghost who will give us a stone key, and have a chat with Professor O'Leary, who gives us the Scroll of Revelation, which will be important to our quest later on. From here, we'll have to travel to the Rebel Camp. Behind it is a fountain where David will use the Scroll of Revelation, revealing a path that we can take. We'll notice that some enemies in this section have been beefed up a little. They're still not too much of a challenge, especially not while we have Fuge's double swords, but they're noticeably more difficult. After fighting through waves of enemies, we'll make our way to a camp where we will find the Time Orb and a Green Key. I swear these things are getting easier to find by the minute. 
We'll continue down the path until eventually we'll meet another boss enemy, this time finally with a different mechanic. The boss will spawn minions over and over, disappearing whenever we get close to him or attack him with a ranged weapon. Eventually, after killing enough of the minions, he will change his pattern and no longer summon, opting to attack us directly instead. It's too bad that he does this since the first part was actually a bit frustrating, but it was also interesting. I was hoping for a certain mechanic which we needed to do in order to make the enemy stop disappearing, but after he just started attacking us after a while, it was just another round of tank the damage and keep attacking. The enemy will leave us with an iron key after he dies, which we can use to open a gate, which will give us access to a golem summoning spell and a bone key for our trouble. Alright, we have one more orb left to get. Before we make our way back over to Deadgate, we'll have to head to the sewers where we find the Armageddon special attack. It's one of the most overpowered moves in the game. By using it, we'll fire a focused set of beams from our sword to all enemies in the area. It's powerful enough to clear entire groups, but it unfortunately also suffers from a long cooldown period. From here, we'll head over to the Boneyard in Deadgate and open a magical door with the bone key we got from the last boss fight. And this is where I ran into a problem. See, we'll be facing a type of enemy called Beholders, and we cannot target them properly because I rushed through the game without getting an Amulet of Seeing. Now, we could go back and get it, but at this point I also realized we can damage the Beholders without the Amulet, so I decided not to do so and just take the hard route. The easiest way to defeat the Beholders is to use the aforementioned Armageddon special attack since it targets every enemy in the vicinity and since each character can use the special attack separately, you could probably clear this room a lot faster than I did because I also didn't use it at that point. Eventually though, we'll end up in a room where we'll have to fight an enemy called the Lady of Light. Seeing as she'll be one of the final bosses in the game before we start the endgame bit, I thought it'd be a grand epic battle, but to be fair, even after this fight, the fight with Fuge was still the highlight so far. The Lady of Light will disappear and reappear every so often after an attack, at which time we can attack her as well. If we keep this up long enough, we'll defeat her, and we'll find the Light Orb in the next room waiting for us, giving us control of every single one of them. And you know what that means. It's time to bring the fight to Silver at this point. We'll head back to the rebel camp and spend all of our hard-earned gold at Dr. Bazuki's shop to stack up on potions before we start talking to Duke. During the talk, Glass will show up and tell us that she has enough strength to transport three people through the shield surrounding Silver's area of Metalon. How convenient to the plot that she's able to transport that exact number of people. In any case. We'll be able to pick the party we'll take with us to Medlon, but at this point we've fought through almost the entire game with Kagan and Vivian, so we're just going to stick with them. Glass then teleports us, and it's time to start the final encounter with Silver. When she does so, she doesn't send us to the outskirts of Medlon so we can prepare or have the element of surprise. Oh no, she teleports us right into the thick of it, Silver's henchmen being upon us from the moment we spawn in. And again, we'll notice a definite step up from the earlier enemies that we fought. Silver soldiers will oftentimes block our attacks and sidestep. Essentially, this doesn't really do much in the terms of difficulty. It just makes fights with these enemies drag on far longer than they should. A large part of making it through Metalon is to stop Silver's supply of blood. This is what provides him with his power, and by taking it away from him, we will increase our chances of beating him in a fight. As we continue our mission through his stronghold, we'll find an item called the Analectus. We'll need to use it to summon a portal, which takes us further into Metalon. On our way, we'll encounter a mechanical monster in a tube. Luckily, it doesn't seem like he's active now. In the next room, we'll find a shrine, where we'll use the Analectus, and blood will gush out of the castle walls. The mechanical monster shows up, and we're thrust into a fight with it. Again, it's not so much of a trial in a manner of technique. It mostly consists of using our special attacks and kiting the enemy so both David and our teammates can get some good damage in until it goes down. After the fight, we'll reach Silver's Temple, his inner sanctum. 
This will be the last part of the game, and boy does it show. We'll be fighting more of Silver's men alongside a new enemy, the Magicians. The Magicians are annoying as all hell. When we get close to them, they'll disappear and reappear somewhere else, and just like the soldier enemies we've been facing thus far, it just makes the fights last longer than they should, since all they do is soak up damage until they eventually die. In the last part of the Inner Sanctum, we'll find a character named Oberius, who tells us the way that we can defeat Silver. We'll have to use the power of the magic orbs and shoot his chandelier with them, taking him down. It turns out that Silver has no intention of marrying any of the women that he's captured. He intends to sacrifice them to appease a demon named Apocalypse in order to attain the ultimate power of darkness. Well, I guess this will be the time to take the final battle to him. We'll fight through a few more rooms until we finally reach the throne room where Silver will be waiting for us. Jennifer! She can't hear you. I've spared you the annoyance of an emotional reunion and placed them in a trance. But don't worry. I won't deny you your right to watch them die. And the rest of the women? Are they still alive? For now, they're waiting patiently elsewhere. I just couldn't deny myself the pleasure of killing these three personally. <laughs> Lord, you have the rebels as I promised you would. So please, grant me leave and tell me where I'll find Camille. Silver, please, I beg you, tell me where I'll find my wife. No, I don't think... I will. But, Lord, we had an agreement. You gave me your word. What value has an oath given to a spineless nothing? Camille will be sacrificed along with the others. <laughs> no! Now, it's your turn. Well, we finally have our epic showdown with Silver, and it's pretty much a letdown. Don't get me wrong, taking him down is still loads of fun, but he doesn't really do anything per se. Silver will hang back on the sides and summon robots from time to time, which we can take down with a single special attack. They'll drop magic orbs, which allow us to replenish our MP, and after we defeat a robot, we have free reign to shoot the chandelier for a few seconds. The fight is a single phase, no special attacks whatsoever. Kill the robots, shoot the chandelier with the magic orb it's attuned to, rinse and repeat a few times, and that's it. After the last chandelier phase is done, Silver will teleport to the middle of the room, and he wants us to finish him off. David refuses initially, but out of nowhere a hulking man in black armor appears and kills Silver. His name is Nemesis, apparently he's Silver's arch-rival, and he's been with us from the beginning. Not that I've seen him, mind you. Nemesis kills Silver and tells us that the job is done, however, Apocalypse shouts from the void that someone has to pay for Silver's death. Nemesis tells us that we need to merge, and David just tells him to hurry up. This part just... comes out of nowhere. Nemesis, Apocalypse, people merging... It's kinda like there were awesome things planned from the onset of the game and I missed half of it when I made my way through. It's something that's always struck me as odd whenever I played through Silver, these final characters, Nemesis and Apocalypse, they're thrown at the player in the final act without any build-up. Sure, it's fun to see that there was a bigger bad guy behind Silver the entire time, but it takes away from Silver's role as an antagonist. It almost relinquishes him to nothing more than a henchman. It's a shame. I feel that Silver has been a pretty good antagonist from the beginning, and to see him been done away like this in the final part of the game, it seems kind of unnecessary. But there's nothing we can do now. All we have left is the final fight with Apocalypse. Apocalypse is only a little bit harder to defeat than your standard enemy, but this is mostly since we don't have any access to health potions or magic after we merge with Nemesis. We'll also only be relegated to having the Falcon special attack in our arsenal. But, 
just like almost every other enemy in this game, he has a certain pattern that we can pick up on fairly easily, which makes this fight pretty trivial in comparison to earlier boss fights like Fuge. Apocalypse will be flying most of the time. When he comes in for a landing, it's best to hit him with either a thrust attack or the falcon. He'll do another move where he flies off and slams into the ground, creating a shockwave. Sometimes it's possible to get a hit in, but since we can't heal, I usually just let him do his thing. His next phase is where he'll charge lightning bolts. They'll follow our movement, but if we keep moving ahead and don't turn back, they're fairly easy to dodge. His next phase is where he flies off into the distance. He'll charge up a firebolt and shoot it at us. The only thing we need to do is block it with our shield, since this will reflect the bolt back and damage him. His last phase is where Apocalypse will let the ground erupt and shoot fireballs around the arena. I consider this his most dangerous attack since there doesn't seem much rhyme or reason to where the attacks will end up, so sometimes we'll take a few hits, while other times we'll be perfectly fine. And that is his entire rotation. It's all rinse and repeat from there on. Once he's lost all of his health, Apocalypse will fly towards the middle of the screen and shoot one more fireball at us. We'll deflect it with our shield and the demon will explode, finally ending the terror of both Apocalypse and Silver. We're then treated to a cutscene of an unmerged David emerging from a port. Silver's castle begins to crumble around us, and we'll see a long, long, long section of running for our lives. Everyone makes it out alive, and we see David and the others on a boat, sailing off into the sunset. And that is the story of Silver. To be fair, I was working on the Zone of the Enders video when I dug up the box of this oldie and I'm very glad I did. It's not the most fantastic game around, and most of my playthrough was heavily colored by nostalgia from when I played it all those years ago on the family PC. When you break down the somewhat simplistic story, you can see it's heavily influenced by common RPG tropes. Your wife, possibly substituting the princess in this narrative, is kidnapped. The bad guy is present and known from the start, and you band together with a group of misfits to combat the great evil. I feel it's elevated by the fantastic delivery of some of the voice actors. Silver's voice actor in particular plays the role perfectly, as an over-the-top, irredeemable bad guy, and the recordings sound crisp to this day. The combat system takes a bit of getting used to. There were times during the game where I was in the heat of battle and accidentally let go of the control button clicking another character and taking control of them during combat, which kind of took me out of the flow. Also, the AI that controls your companion characters can be uh, questionable at times. It can get a bit confusing at times, but once you get the hang of it, it's actually pretty solid, and I wish there could have been a sequel where the developers would have had the chance to refine the combat system and see what they could have come up with in the next installment. The soundtrack by Dean Evans is fantastic, in my opinion. The dreary motif of the background song in Rain is one of the best tracks in the game, and I loved listening to it while I was writing up the script and editing the video to this game. Graphically, the game hasn't aged well. The character models reminding me of a slightly upgraded version of the character models from Final Fantasy VII, but the remaster of Silver does a fair amount of polish to not make it offendable. To be fair, I might be looking at them through nostalgia goggles since I just have so many memories playing this game in my childhood. It's understandable that with the game being a new IP at the time, it got lost in the shuffle with big contemporary titles releasing around the same time, such as Final Fantasy VIII, Baldur's Gate II, and Diablo II. It's quite a shame, since I feel if the devs had more time to work on the game, I feel they could have possibly made this a series with multiple entries. The game isn't terribly long, and you can generally finish a playthrough in about 10 hours or less. There's a remastered version that you can buy on Steam right now. I bought it on sale for about 2 bucks, and for that money, I can highly suggest playing it. Even when it's not on sale, the game is about 6 bucks, give or take, and for that price as well, it's a steal. In short, it's a good game. It's not without its flaws, but it's definitely enjoyable to this day if you feel like picking it up. And that's all I have to say about Silver. 
Definitely let me know if you have any memories of the game or if you have any thoughts in the video. As always, if you'd like to support the channel, drop a like or subscribe. Again, you don't have to, but I'd like it if you did. As for now, I'll see you in the next video, buddy. Take care.